The Body Church is dedicated to proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ through authentic worship, Bible study, and service. Located in Atlanta, we're called to create a loving and caring community for all people and work together for justice and truth in our world. Recognizing that our spiritual journeys are all different, we strive to help people discover where they fit and pursue their purpose in Christ. If you've been searching for a place where real people with real problems are searching for genuine solutions, The Body Church may very well be the perfect fit. Visit thebodychurchinc.org for service times or call us if you have any questions. Thank you for your presence. We thank you for being here. We thank you for Jesus, for that prayer, that, that important prayer concerning unity. Lord, concerning oneness. Lord, we, we agree with that prayer. We come in agreement. We agree, God, with all that was said. And Lord, we pray that today, as we go to the next installment of this series, Lord, give us wisdom to understand all that's being said. Give us revelation. Lord, help us to, to have open minds and hearts, Lord, to hear your voice. Lord, speak to us. Lord, amazing things that we've, Lord, yearned to hear from you. Pray for the spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of you. We open our hearts to hear your voice. Everyone say this after me. Say, Father, I open my heart as good soil for your word. Whatever I need to hear, I ask for you to speak to me. Let it be clear. Let there be no distractions. And let me get it. So that my life will never be the same again. I have the Holy Spirit. And the spirit of understanding, the spirit of intelligence, the spirit of knowledge is inside of me. I have wisdom from God. And I will walk away from this message, knowing exactly what you want me to know. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Good to see you, Joella, again. Joella was there in Trinidad when we did a, a session on, what was that? We did coffee shop. No, you didn't come to coffee shop. You came to Friday night. I did a session on something. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. It was a Kingdom Economic session on Friday night. Yeah, some of the stuff, y'all you, didn't get that yet. We, I give, you got two hours right now. I couldn't give you three. So <laughs> I had to leave some stuff out. You know what I'm saying? But over the years, we will get to all of that stuff. But we had a really good session on Friday night in Trinidad. And she's, she's gritty. She got the stuff in Trinidad. And she come here and she get the stuff up here. She get more than anybody else. But hey, that's all right. That's all right. Praise the Lord. We, we're happy that she's back. Let's get into this thing here. Let's read our assignment together on the screen. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, together, after 3, 2, 3. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the knowledge, to the unity of the faith, and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So the assignment of the fivefold ministry gifts Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher continues until the entire church is unified in the faith. So we've been digging into this for a while and we will continue until we drain it. Next, 1 Corinthians 12, 12 on the screen. Let's read it together after three, two, three. The human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. So the church can be compared to a human body. Each part is unique, looks different, and functions in a different capacity. Just like the human body, we have only one head, Jesus. We are only at our best, but the entire body works together as a coordinated unit. So John 17, 9 to 23. Let's go to John 17. That's the prayer Jesus prayed. That's the theme of this message. And this is, this is the basis upon which we're digging into this entire series. John 17, 9 to 23. Now, if you have a lot of energy and you pay attention, this is going to go really quickly. And there's turkey and chicken and all kinds of nice stuff outside. 
and we're going to get it. All right? So everybody's with me? Yes. Good. So you got to be engaged with me so I can, I can knock this baby out. John 17, 9 to 23. All right, I will read. Unless if you have New King James Version, read with me if you have New King James Version. If you don't, read under your breath. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world, but these are in the world. And I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name. Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth, your word is truth. And you sent me, as you sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also may be sanctified by the truth. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, I and me, and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Let's go over number 22 again, verse 22. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one, just as we are one, I in them, and you in me that they may be made perfect in one, and that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them as you have loved me. Father, I desire that they also, whom you gave me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, the world has not known you, but I have known you. And these have known that you sent me, and I have declared to them your name, and will declare it, that the love which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. So when Jesus knew that the time of his death was imminent, he prayed one of the most important prayers he had ever prayed. He prayed for unity in his body, and contained in that prayer are secrets of divine unity. And that's our series. So here are Jesus' suffering secrets of unity, based on John 17, 9-23. And what you see underlined, that's what we are done with. And what you see not on the line, that's what we're still working on. And we're going to take our time until we squeeze this thing dry. Anybody been in a series here before and been through an entire series? It could take nine months. Hey, go give birth at the end of this to your destiny. Jesus' seven secrets of unity. Let's read it together from the top. From number one. Number one, the name of Christ unites. Number two, God's word sets us apart. Number three, our mission unites us. Number four, we are only one in him. Number five, God's glory unites us. Number six, unity testifies of Jesus. Number seven, the love of Christ unites us. On the website, you can get all that we've already done and we will move on afresh. God's glory makes us one. John 17, 22 to 23. Let's read it on the screen together after three, two, three. And the glory which you gave me, I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. I in them and you in me, that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that you have sent me and you have loved them as you have loved me. So here is Jesus saying, look, I gave them my glory so they may be one just like you and I are one. Everybody gets it? And that's what we're going to dig into. So God's glory makes us one. As a result, it's important for God's glory to be evident among us if we are to experience true unity. So what is God's glory? We're going to begin with the Hebrew word, kabod. God's glory is the Hebrew word kabod. Let's read on the screen what the word kabod means. After three, two, three. God's substance, essence, heavy presence. So whenever you see God's glory, you, in this context, you're looking at the heavy presence of God, the substance of God, the essence of God. When God really shows up and you can sense him and you can feel him, that's what we mean by God's glory. The word glory has many meanings, but in terms of this context and in terms of this part of the message, we are dealing with when God shows up and you can feel it. Everybody gets that? So when God shows up in his glory, everyone present feels the weight of it. And it's very easy to know when God's presence is in the room because you will feel it. You're going to know 
there's more going on here than just a bunch of people singing a song. You're going to feel something different. Everybody understands that? He affects the atmosphere. What is God's glory in the Greek? The word doxa. Let's go ahead and read what that means. On the screen, two, three. The unspoken manifestation of God, the divine quality of God, and God's infinite intrinsic worth. So when we talk about God's glory, we're talking about Him manifesting Himself. When somebody manifests, it means that now you can see them. We know God's everywhere. We know God's omnipresent. And we know God is a spirit also. So we always know God is here. There is no time when God is not here. But when God manifests himself and you can't deny it, when you can sense his quality, when you know God is there and you can tangibly tell something changed in the atmosphere, you're dealing with God in his glory. Everybody understands that? So we're distinguishing between God the Spirit being everywhere and then God manifesting himself. You see him now. You feel him now. Wow, you can tell he's doing something. Everybody understands that? Good. So an encounter with God's glory, we're going to ask 2, 1 to 4 on the screen. We're going to talk about the most popular encounter with God's glory that we all know. The upper room, the book of Acts. We all talk about that. That's how the church started. Everybody understands? So let's read it on the screen together. Acts 2, 1 to 4, New Living Translation. After 3, 2, 3. On the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. Suddenly, there was a sound from heaven, like the roaring of a mighty windstorm, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them. So here is God's glory manifesting in the upper room. So on the day of Pentecost, about 120 believers experienced the most well-known release of God's glory in human history. And that initial widespread encounter changed human history forever. And from it, we can learn valuable lessons about what happens when people see God's glory. Go to Acts 2, 36 to 47. Acts 2, 36 to 47. When you're there, say amen. Give me one more email and I'll read. Acts 2, 36 to 47. Anybody else? All right. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to him, repent. And let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. So this story we're looking at here is what happens. In fact, let me keep going. And when... And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together, and had all things in common, and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had need. So continuing in daily, with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. So, you know, everybody has, different, everybody has their fantasies, as the, the thing that they dream of. Well, when it comes to the church, this is our fantasy. Everybody in church dreams of the day your church looks like the book of Acts when the church first started. That's our fantasy. Boy, could we be like them. We want that. And as a result, we want to dissect this thing so that this fantasy can be a reality. What really happened? What can we glean from this and what can we grab from what they did so that we can see what they saw? Everybody understands that? we don't want to just fantasize because it's good to fantasize and be like oh we wish we wish you know please god let it happen like the book of acts but it's also good to get some information together and begin to understand what really happened so that we can get it ourselves we don't just want to dream 
We want reality. And we want it to be our reality. Everybody understands that? So that's what happens after the Holy Spirit shows up. Holy Spirit shows up, and then this community just blossoms. And amazing things start happening. And we're going to dig into this one thing. The Holy Spirit showed up. The glory of God showed up. Then amazing things happened. And that's where this mini-series of this mini-series came from. Everybody understands? So this is the little mini-series we're on right now. Why seek God's glory? What happens when we seek God's glory? Let's go through this list from number one. Number one, God gives us bold words to speak. Number two, we are driven to repentance. Number three, we get a strong sense of the devotion. Number four, we see miracles. Number five, we are drawn together as a community. Number six, we raise our level of worship and praise. And number seven, we are set free and transformed. And we are going to review what we've done already. God gives us bold words. Acts 1, 8. Let's read it together on the screen. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Acts 2, 1 to 4. And everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this ability. So we see in both cases, here is a manifestation of the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit gives them the ability to speak in other languages. Here is Jesus saying, when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you will be a witness. So when the anointing shows up, when the Holy Spirit shows up, when the glory of God shows up, people get bold. Not just that. You can pray and the glory shows up and get bold. Acts 4, 31. Let's read it. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. When the Lord shows up in his glory, you get bold about Jesus. Anytime you're shy about Jesus, you need an encounter with God. You, you, need, you need to run into him. Because when you're running to him face to face and you, you, you get a feel of the presence of the Lord and you get to see the Lord moving, you get really bold. You get really Christian. You get real serious and intense because you just encountered God. Everybody understands that? Something special about when you encounter God. And we're saying you need to encounter God so that you can get bold and be a witness and be able to stand up for what you know. Everybody understands? So Christians in the early church encountered the glory of God in a way that most of us have never done. They saw fire and the room shook when the Holy Spirit showed up. With that display of his glory, God put words in their mouths along with the boldness to speak them. The glory of God will transform our ability to be witnesses of him. So what happens when we seek God's glory? What's number one? God gives us bold words to speak. Number two, we are driven to repentance. Let's talk about that. God's glory stirs repentance. Acts 2, 36 to 41. Now we read this before. And at the end of the move of the Holy Spirit, the, well, the initial move of the Holy Spirit in the upper room, we saw this community blossom and then we saw something amazing. A Peter preached a message and people were like, what are we supposed to do? And he said, repent. Let's read this together on the screen from after, after three, two, three. After the glorious display of God's presence in the upper room, Apostle Peter preached a message of repentance and people responded. When God's glory comes among us, expect to see mass repentance. That just happens. Isaiah 6, 1 to 6, we read this where Isaiah, in the year the king Uzziah died, Isaiah saw the Lord, the Lord showed up high and lifted up, tree and filled the temple. He saw God in his glory. And the first thing he did was say, ah, uh, yeah, I am unclean. I dwell among people of unclean lips. And God was like, that's all right. Here's a stone from the altar to purge your lips. In other words, the first thing you see when you see God in his glory is that your stuff is not together. And that's one of the reasons why you want to see God in his glory. Because when you see God, like, oh boy, I have to get myself together. I ain't right. I ain't right. I ain't right. You know that. Because you see him, he's perfect. He's awesome. He's amazing. And if he shows up and you really encounter him, you're going to look at yourself and be like, Hey, I need to get myself together. Yeah, boy. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it works. And that's good. You see, no sin can stand in God's presence. When Isaiah saw God's glory, he became keenly aware of his own uncleanness and cried out for mercy. So we see God's glory because it in inspires us to purge our hearts of sin. Nothing and nobody cleans up the church like God himself showing up in his glory. You know, you can, you, you can come and you can tell people, you're like, you, need to, you need to get yourself together. You need to get right. Yeah, it works for some people. But let the Lord show up. Let, let, let us encounter God's presence on a personal level. 
you sort of feel God. You feel that thing, you're feeling, and you're like, oh boy, and this is God. And you're like, yes. You repent for yourself. You want to repent. You're like, somebody give me an altar, let me repent. Because you want to. Because God is here. You encounter God, you want to get right. Everybody understands that? So what happens when we seek God's glory? We spent one week on God gives us boldness to speak. Then we talked about we are driven to repentance. Today we are going to talk about we get a strong sense of devotion. We get a strong sense of devotion. Acts 2, 42 to 43. Let's read it together on the screen. After 3, 2, 3. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. When we talk about devotion, we, we talk about commitment. That's one of the challenges you run into a lot in the church world. Commitment. Obviously, we're committed to our jobs because we know if we don't go to work, we don't eat. So there is a, a, a good reason why five days a week, if you have a nine to five, you get up and you go to work. Sometimes you don't want to do it. Sometimes you don't like the people there. Sometimes you're like, man, I just feel like staying home today. But you make yourself go so you can eat. And that's where people get commitment. People need to be inspired to commit to something, to anything. And when it comes to the church, here is Jesus in his glory as the Holy Spirit resting upon people with fire and shaking the room and stuff. And people are talking in other tongues and all of these things. And, it, and then Peter stands up and preaches like the most amazing message. And then he's like, repent, repent. And 3,000 people get born again. And then all of a sudden we get commitment. You see God. You see amazing things. You start seeing fire. You start getting a room shaking. You start hearing messages that come from heaven. And miracles and all kind of stuff happening, you start thinking, I probably should go to church Sunday morning. I probably should go to church. I just, I just might go. I might just go ahead and read a scripture. I just might. Because I just saw what I just saw and ah, that left an impact on me. I just might pray. Because something happens when you see God in His glory. When God shows up, you start wanting to do godly things. You just start wanting to be real. You start wanting to be consistent. It just happens. You see, anybody who has truly encountered God and God has transformed their lives, you don't have to convince them to be devoted to anything that has to do with God. It's easy. It's easy. It's not even human effort. It's almost like he affects your humanity to the point where what you thought was hard to do becomes really easy. There's a, a, a scripture that talks about, and we will get to that later, how in the early church, there was an awe that came upon them all. Like, and one translation calls that the fear of the Lord, where here's the Holy Spirit shows up and there's something rests on everybody. And then everybody just has that feeling of, man, we be... <laughs> We gotta be serious here. God is here. I can feel God. All of a sudden, everybody was just kind of playing around. And uh, we see it today. We see it six months from now. Hey, what are you doing? Good. You know, just hey, just do what I do. You're like, really? But then the Holy Spirit shows up, and next thing you know, everybody's there. You ever seen those? Oh yeah. I don't know if many of us get into that stuff, but when there's revivals and TBN and well, TBN doesn't really do it as much. There was this channel. What's that other channel? The Word Network, I think it was. Or Goa TV. I think it was Goa TV. Right. Carried a revival on screen. Live and direct. Like they were on the ground. There was some revival in Florida somewhere. They were in church every day. Somebody say every day. Every not, day. not every week. Every they were all the time. All the time. People were just there. And you're asking yourself, huh? That's impossible. How do you get people to come to church? Man, let some stuff start happening. Some miracles are taking place and Holy Spirit starts showing up and you start feeling things and limbs growing out and God starts showing up in the middle of the room and you start hearing like sounds from heaven and that kind of stuff. You start wanting to go to church and then you start going back into all the old revivals and you're like, it's the same story. You go and you read about Toronto, you read about LA, you read about 
Pensacola and you're like, you read about when they had it in Azusa Street, well, that was LA, I think it was. And then you read about when, they, when these revivals took place in Europe and stuff like that. They were in church like all the time. And you're like, how is that possible? There's a sense of devotion that comes when the Lord shows up. Because all of a sudden you start thinking, what's more important than being in God's presence when his presence is that amazing? Like, when we're not accustomed to it being that amazing, it's easy to be like, eh, it doesn't matter. I mean, uh, when I'm there, when I'm not there, I don't feel anything different. I don't see anything different. It doesn't really register anything. But let it be special. Let God really manifest himself and you encounter him on the level that moves you. And next thing you know, it's not going to be hard. Because you begin to value that. You begin to yearn that for that presence. And I think when people, when people realize the scripture that says, in the presence of the Lord is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. One of the things I believe will happen is when you really get that level of closeness to the Lord and you begin to see how pleasurable it is and begin to experience that sense of joy and that sense of fulfillment that comes from the presence of the Lord on that level, then it'll make sense that it'll be easy to commit. Because you begin to really experience it. Because people can talk about him, tell you, well, listen, man, I'm telling you, man, he's just so good. And if you get to know God, it's just going to be amazing. And you're like, yeah, that's true, that's true. Yeah, sounds good, sounds good to me. Yeah, amen. But, man, you run into the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit moves you. The Lord starts doing things in your life and you start feeling him. You start knowing this is really God. It becomes really easy. And here we have a church that just experienced the upper room experience that just saw God come in his glory with fire, shaking the room with power. And guess what happens? Let's read it together on the screen. After three, two, three. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing of meals, including the Lord's Supper and to prayer. So before they got to this part, the Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Apostle Peter stood up and preached a message of his life. 3,000 people joined them. And then this is what happened. Obviously, because we, we fantasize about being like the book of Acts, we just jump straight to what we want. This is what we want. Everybody knows that. But to get here, we got to go back to verse 1. we got to go back to the beginning. How did this thing start? It started with a move of the Holy Ghost. After the move of the Holy Ghost, then we progress to get to this. And we're saying we want that move of the Holy Ghost that can trigger something like this. We don't just want to artificially create this. We can't. In our own strength, by the power of agreement, by the power of mental fortitude, we will do this. We will be devoted. We're like, nah, that don't work. It never works. We're like, Lord, we want you to supernaturally come up in this place and encounter us so that people will finally understand the level of commitment that you not, don't just require, but that you desire. You want to be close and you want us to be consistent. Everybody understands that? So after experiencing the dramatic display of God's glory, Christians in the early church were devoted to the teaching of their apostles. Fellowship with each other, eating together, and prayer. It was no wonder that the power of God was evident among them. Yeah. Everybody understands that? So what we're seeing here is luck. We can talk a big talk. We can say we want... You know, we want to be devoted, we want to be connected, and all that kind of stuff. But reality is, the scripture says, taste and see that the Lord is good. you got to get a taste. you got to really experience God to, to appreciate who he really is. So that it'll be easy to be devoted. And that's important. I think one of the things, we, the advantage somebody like I have, I can come to church like this. And I'm already devoted because I have encountered God in amazing ways already. So as a result, now, there's nothing God has to do to kind of woo me or to get my attention for me to be like, Ooh, wow, well, after that, now I'm committed. No, he's done the now I'm committed stuff already. So I'm at that stage in my life, right, where now I'm already devoted. So now we're saying, God, we want you to show up so that everybody else can get an opportunity to experience you on that level. Because when everybody gets that, nobody has to force you to be committed. Nobody has to force you to be devoted. And look at, look at how it said. Nobody had to force them to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Nobody had to force them to be devoted to fellowship. 
Nobody had to force them to share meals, the Lord's Supper, to pray. Nobody had to force them to pray. There was no, you guys need to come and pray. You need to pray. Look, we need to, we need to pray. The Lord, the Lord just, He wants us to pray. Just pray and beg and beg. Pray, please, please pray. We don't beg and beg. We don't need to beg. We ain't begging. We're like, listen, we're like, Lord, please, send your glory, send your anointing, do something so that we all get the point. Because it takes too much stress and effort to try to force anybody to please, please be committed, please. We can't do that. We're like, Lord, do something. You do what you do, and all of a sudden it's going to be really easy. Because each of us who have encountered God in our own lives already understand what that did to us. When you see the Lord, when you feel his presence and it's really strong, when the Lord does something to you, it's like a switch goes off. And it's something inside. I don't know what it is. It's like, I don't know. I, I, mean, I don't know. I'm just going to talk and if it gets it again. There's like a switch that's inside of each human being. There's something in you that there's like a God switch. There's something in you that flips when you encounter God at a certain level. Like below that level... Ah, it's still human effort. It's still somebody going to convince you. It's still somebody going to motivate you. Come on. Come on. You can be a Christian. Come on. You can come to church. Come on. You can read your Bible. But then at some point, there's a switch that flips. And hopefully for us, it happens younger than it happens older. Because when it flips younger, you have a lifetime of walking with the Lord and seeing him do amazing things. Versus not having that and then reaching a certain age and finding it switches and you're like, man, I wish, man, 30 years of my life, I would have, man, I, ah, I did some stuff and ah, I could have, I could have, should have, would have, had I. And our thing now is, look, here is the Lord saying, I am using the scriptures to reach out to each person's heart and say, listen, you want to encounter me. And one thing God is, the scripture says, draw nigh unto me and I will draw nigh unto you. What does that mean? It means I'm not just going to draw nigh unto you. It does, it's not just going to happen. It has to be we choose to draw nigh to him. And yes, on an individual basis, we have to choose that, which is true. But also as, on a corporate basis, we have to choose that also. We are going to draw nigh to him. We are going to reach out. We're going to stretch our necks out and stretch our hearts out and our hands out and say, God, we're going to make an effort to reach out to you so that you can reach out to us. Everybody understands that? And the, reason why we're, and the reason why we're doing this through teaching is because first we need to educate you as to what we're talking about so you understand. Then we're going to say, good, now let's do it. But it's no sense we just saying let's do it and you don't get it. Yeah. Anybody's been, you know, whether it's in a church or in worship or whatever and somebody says, you know, let's just reach out to the glory of God. The glory of God is here. And you don't understand what they're saying. Some of the results, you're like, well, that's cool, man. The glory of God is here, amen. Yeah, let's keep singing. All right, good, good. Whenever they finish, I'll just be, so I can go do what I need to do because I left the stove on and I got, yeah. The glory of God, you're like, yeah, whatever, glory. And you go home. But let that happen to you once where you finally see God. Let the Lord show up, feel something. Let the Lord speak to you on a level where it scares you. Let the Holy Spirit show up. I remember one time I was praying in the car. Somebody called. My dad was preaching in Ghana. And I guess he got food poisoning. Ate whatever they were feeding him. And, but I didn't know it was food poisoning. So he goes to the hospital. And the Ghanaian doctor was like, Oh my God, you got to rush him to surgery now. Now he has, his appendix just exploded. And I mean, I don't know what equipment they were using. But that, that was it. So, you know, that's limited information. So that information is relayed to my mother. So my mother calls one intercessor and says, listen, I just need you guys to pray. You know, because she doesn't know what's going on. Well, no, she's there. She's there. So she's there. So she's here in the doctor too. So she calls the intercessor. And the intercessor, in good faith, decides to call other intercessors who, in good faith, decide to call... My aunt, who in good faith, decides to call my brother, who in good faith, calls me. And next thing you know, everybody knows he's about to get rushed into surgery. And the only information we have is something, the appendix exploded. I mean, all kinds, I mean, and so I, listen, 
I think we were talking. Angel and I were, we, were we married yet? We were not married. Listen. Somebody called and said something like that. I said, what? I couldn't even think. Because you don't know what's going on. And the information you're getting is like harrowing. <laughs> and it's like, you, you got to put pieces together. Listen. I've prayed before in my life. I can tell you I've prayed. I've prayed for different things. But I've never prayed like that day. Never. Like never. When I tell you, I've still not prayed like that. I mean, all the times I prayed in my life, added up together, kind of compare to the prayer I prayed that day. Yeah. Never. Never. Because yeah. there's, there's never been anything to trigger a prayer like that. And, you know, and, I, and, and, and the reason why I knew it was the Lord directing me, because initially I could not pray. I couldn't pray. I could barely talk. I couldn't do anything. I was just like, and you know, you get sketchy information. And you can't talk to mommy, you can't talk to daddy, and they're in Ghana. Not that anything's wrong with Ghana, but they're in Ghana. I mean, I'm like, Lord, and, and mommy's like, ain't nobody gonna do no surgery in no Ghana. <laughs> they're like, I don't care. When we get to London, we'll figure it out, but ain't nobody gonna do no surgery in Ghana, whatever it is. Emergency is emergency. Nobody in Ghana no gonna do no surgery here. Get me out of this country. Nonetheless, obviously, he's going nowhere. So I called my friend, Nate. I said, Nate, I couldn't even talk. I didn't know what I told him. I don't know if I made sense, if I was coherent. But he knew me enough. He started praying. He prayed, he prayed. And he prayed the most amazing prayer. And that's, that's why it's great to have certain type of friends who've encountered God. Yes. Nate, that's what Nate said. Nate prayed that if it is what we're hearing it is, that God will reverse the time back to before what it was and change the circumstances so that the circumstances will not be what it really is and then we'll never even know that it was God who switched the whole thing. Amen. So the, story, the whole story changed like a couple hours later, right? But I mean, nonetheless, that's what he prayed. He's like, turn this whole thing around, stop time, take it backwards, switch the situation, bring it back. You know what I'm saying? Because he can pray that kind of stuff. He's encountered the Lord. He knows things. He's touched God's glory. He knows what happens when you get to that level of authority. And he can walk in that kind of stuff. And I needed that. Because I didn't have none at that point. I, I couldn't think. I was like, oh, no, Lord, I don't know what to do. And I'm crying and I can't talk. And, I don't do. and he's like, yeah, I, I get it. I get it. And he started praying. I get in my car. And, I, and I'm, I'm driving. And I start to pray. I felt the presence of the Lord before. But I didn't even know how I was driving. Because the entire car was cloudy. And the Lord was in that place. And I was just praying. I got so much energy. I prayed in tongues. I prophesy. It was just me alone in my car, driving. I don't even know if I could see where I'm going. Everything is misty. The entire car is misty. All the glass is fogged up. Everything, you can't see what's going on. And I know I'm driving. And I'm praying. And then there was a moment where something switched. Now, I've heard people talk about that. I mean, I prayed until I got the release, and it just sounds so deep. And you're like, right. You just pray until you felt like stopping, you know? But there was that moment when I'm praying, I just felt like, Choop. it's done. And I just stopped, and I just started driving. And I got the call, look, oh, it was food poison. Oh, really? <laughs> now, I knew what Nate prayed. I was like, yeah, it was food poison, right. Yeah. Amen. He just had some eggs, and it was fine. I was like, praise the Lord. Assignment complete. Amen. And because of that encounter, I can tell you something that I learned that day. That day I learned that there's nothing impossible with God. And I know people say, say that all the time. And it's just kind of, it's not impossible with God. Amen. Blah, blah, blah. No, no. That's the day I learned we can stop stuff. We can start stuff. We can change stuff. We can rearrange stuff. We have that kind of power. But until you have done it in your life and you've seen the Holy Spirit show up like that, you would know you can walk like that. And as a result, it removes all fear. It removes all confusion. And it gives you devotion. I'm not going to not come to church. I'm not going to be like, oh, forget this church. Forget the word of God. I'm backsliding because the Lord didn't give me what I wanted or whatever. I can't do that because I've seen him and I've encountered him. And that's what we want for everybody in this church. Everybody understands that? Yes. Now let's stand off it. So what happens when we seek God's glory? Let's read it together. Number one, God gives us bold words to speak. Number two, 
We are driven to repentance. Number three, we get a strong sense of devotion. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for your presence. We thank you for being here with us. Lord, for 